Hey, welcome back. This is our second lecture in the fundamentals of electrical and computer engineering. Um, so today we are looking at what our core circuit values really mean, uh, the fundamental law that we we use to, to really understand electricity and that kind of governs circuits, um, the, the types of circuits. There are many types of circuits, but specifically we're talking about AC and DC and what that really means. And finally, applying it to diagrams and figuring out how to talk the same language about electricity. Um, again, not a, not a super mathy lecture. That'll start next week. Alrighty, so just a little bit of a refresher from last week. We remember that electricity is the behavior, the behavior of electrons through a material. Right? But we also said that when we're when we're talking colloquially, that electricity, we really mean current. Because current is the, the flow of charges. So, do we always need to think about electrons in order to turn on a light switch or a toaster? Do we, do we need to think about electrons in order to, to do math with it and, and work on it? No, no, no. We, we don't really need, we don't need the atomic level of things. And thank goodness, because it can get really, really daunting, uh, if not kind of confusing, right? We can't see these. We have to kind of trust that this diagram that scientists shook hands for is accurate enough to keep going. Um, so, kind of like we don't need to think about the molecules of a mass in a Newtonian physics problem. Like, like we don't need to know what material this is to know that it is affected by gravity. So there's a, a force due to gravity. And since it's on a surface, it's got a normal force. Uh, it... It's being dragged, right? So it's got a tension force that has an X and a Y component. And since it's being dragged in this direction, we know that there is a reactive force, uh, or maybe a resistive force, that is, is the equal opposite of the, specifically X, direction of this tension force. So we know... We, we just know this, right? We've, we've done this enough times. We've seen this in things like our statics and our deformable bodies and our dynamic systems classes and things like that. Like, we, we know these things. This is how we define the paradigm of, of sciences we can, we can hold in our hands, right? Unfortunately, we cannot really hold electrons in our hands. Our hands are made up of electrons. Yeah. Um not super helpful in the 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 metaphor department. Especially since we can we can we can tie a rope to a cinder block and drag it and viscerally experience all of this. But we can't really tie a rope to an electron and drag it through the circuit and figure out what it's like to be in the circuit. We don't we can't experience electricity in the same way. Even though we can be pretty sure there's some currents going through it and and there's probably a voltage and a voltage and and you know, there's there's a resistance here and there's some complex number impedance here. It we we can know these things academically, but they don't feel as real as dragging a cinder block as proof of of friction and and gravity so we use these these other values to describe the system right we don't we don't need to talk about electrons more uh 
honestly, you can bring things down to electrons if you want to. Just like you you could bring down mass uh, to specific gravity of atoms. We don't want to do that. That's a lot. It's just, it's superfluous calculations. You don't need to do them in order to prove that the forces exist. And the same kind of goes for for circuits. So I kind of want to draw some some parallels. Um, the same way that Newtonian physics can be defined by mass, time, and distance, uh, we can also we can also define electricity. So like, for instance, if you have time and distance of some some object, some some mass, right? You've got velocity. Because velocity is the change in distance with respect to the change in time. And you know, you because you've got that, you've also got acceleration. Right? Because acceleration is just the change in velocity with respect to the change in time. Cool beans. And if you've got if you've got mass, if you've got mass and acceleration, you've got force, right? F equals MA. But not just that, you've also got energy, right? Because potential energy is mgh right that's just y distance and mass and acceleration because it's the acceleration due to gravity right but we've also got kinetic energy because that one is one half mv squared right so we've got velocity we got mass so from these three these these three values, these three types of values, characteristic values, we can completely create the the paradigm that we understand physical objects and objects in motion. So we can do that with electricity too. Yeah, so so everything effectively revolves around oops, that's the highlighter revolves around F equals MA, which is one of Newton's laws. It's the, the foundational law and also conservation of energy, right? Total energy is MGH plus MV squared over 2, right? So so there's some some fundamental law and some Law of conservation, right? Energy can't be created or destroyed. The, the, the energy in the system in equals energy of the system out. That kind of stuff. So in electricity, we have characteristic values too. But they're not the same characteristic values. Otherwise, we'd be in the same system, right? So we've got charge, which we talked about, right? That one is little q or, you know, big Q for generic charge, but, you know, the way that electrons have a charge of Q, of minus Q. Uh, we've also got time. We're not escaping that one, unfortunately. Uh, and we've got impedance. And combining these, we can get the, char the, the many different equations that define a circuit and electricity. So if we say have charge and time, we've got current. DQ, DT, right? The change in charge with respect to the change in time. And if we've got just charge, we've got voltage. Because voltage is the potential energy uh the electric potential energy so the the 
potential energy due to electricity, right? Over charge. And just to just to prove to you that this this isn't this isn't some some magic made up number, uh there is an equation for this, right? And it's charge of the nucleus of an atom times the charge of an electron over four epsilon zero pi and then radius. So epsilon zero, don't have to worry about that. That is just a constant. This is a a, a medium constant. It just talks about how easy it is for for a, electrons to transfer through air. Uh, radius is literally the radius between the the nucleus and whatever shell the electron's on. That's it. So technically voltage is charge and charge together. Let's see here. Then we have impedance values, right? So impedance is actually a twofold uh number and it's made out of resistance which is rho l over a where this is a material property. It's called rho it doesn't help if I spell it in Greek. There we go. This is a material property. It's called the resistivity. And every material has a resistivity. Your pencil. Your... The, the glass in your computer. You. A hot dog. Everything has a resistivity. We just have to experimentally find it. Um, impedance is also made out of reactance, which is is dependent on. Uh, it's it's device dependent. So. It also it comes from, innate properties of the device. So, uh, there's actually a couple of different reactance equations, but. Either way, if you have, if you have current and voltage and impedance, we've also got this relationship, V equals I R. This is the most fundamental law of electricity. This, everything comes down to, this is the equation that you won't be able to not memorize because you're going to use it so much. This one is called Ohm's Law. And uh, it, it is literally just the relationship of voltage, current, and resistor. Uh, our conservation is derived from Ohm's Law and the nature of circuits. And we call those Kirchhoff's Laws. He's got two of them. Uh, one is the voltage law. And one is the current law. And both of them say that across a certain, uh, a certain type of geometry in a circuit, there's conservation. Uh, the voltage law describes how uh, the total voltage around a loop so, in a complete circuit, equals zero, which should make sense. Everything you put in should come back out. And the current through a node, so I node, so when you have a situation like this, where you've got three or more devices connected together, all of the current you put in there should come out, even if it's bifurcated. So, 
we say that this one is all of the current in plus all of the current out equals zero. These are conservation, but they're, they're specific situation conservation. So around a node or through a node, current is conserved. In a single in a single path of a circuit, voltage is conserved. And we'll we'll definitely dive deeper into uh kind of how to apply that and what those mean. But yeah, also breaking out the, the series notation kind of rough. Uh so let's kind of get some 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 gut check ability out of voltage current and impedance. Because they're still just things that you can't really experience. Well, I mean, you could, but you wouldn't be happy about it. Um, for instance, when you put a 9-volt battery to your tongue, you are experiencing current and voltage. You are the impedance. Um, not not the most fun thing to to. to experience to, to physically feel we we'd much prefer these things to stay on paper in calculations and not zapping us or our fellow man so let's let's start by thinking about this hourglass it's full of sand it's made to to meter a certain amount of sand over a given time well, what does that sound like? A certain amount of something over time? I mean, if you think about the grains of sand as, say, charges, if these are all little little electrons in here, well, that sounds an awful lot like current. Because current is the change in charge over change in time, right? Which, you know, we get in derivative form because derivatives are inescapable. Well, it's because derivatives describe change relationships, right? So, we also know that there's some energy due to gravity because of the amount of sand. And why do we know that? Okay, so think about this. If you are at the top of a pool, or say, if you are sitting on top of a bunch of sand, it's it's pretty easy, right? You don't feel a whole lot of weight. But then if you go all the way down to the bottom of a diving pool, it feels heavy, right? So that's because there is a mass of of water above you. Well, there's a mass of sand above the sand that is exiting this this uh, thin spot in the hourglass. So, so because of this height, there's a little extra energy being pushed out. Because when you're when you're flat against the bottom of a pool, you're not going anywhere, but you are feeling a force. Well, there is there is energy being imparted there and since the sand can escape th through this very thin little spot in the hourglass it ends up retaining some of that energy it that energy is imparted to it to each particle of sand well what do we know that is energy per something that's voltage right Voltage is the potential, and, well, we know that, that a height-based energy is potential energy, right? Uh, there we go. There we go. So, so, we know that this is a potential energy because it's due to gravity and height. Well, that's what the sand's experiencing. Well, voltage is not experiencing gravity, but it is experiencing a potential energy, an electrical potential energy. So voltage is the potential R, G, Y, there we go. 
energy imparted per charge. So, you know, V equals electrical potential energy per Q, right? So let's see if we can make this, this metaphor go just a little bit further. We know that there is something resisting the flow of sand, right? Because in the real world, we have friction. Same with, with the brick we're dragging. It's feeling friction because of the surface and its bottom surface, right? Well, the sand's also experiencing friction. Each particle of sand has some surface area and it's touching some other sand and sometimes a lot of other sand. And each of those are resisting each other. And we also know that that the thing that is constricting the flow of sand, the reason the sand doesn't all just dump out to the bottom as soon as you turn it over, is the geometry of the glass, right? The, the way the hourglass is made prevents a bunch of sand from going out all at once. Well, so the geometry the geometry and friction of the sand this this is impedance. And it is unfortunately a complex number. But this is how one component can be the, the friction and one component can be the shape, right? So a complex number takes the form of A plus IB. But we've already got a problem, right? Because I is current. in electricity. So we can't use i. We can't use i as the imaginary number. We have to use j. We use j. Which is kind of blindsiding uh, when you are used to using i and then suddenly a class is just like, all right, here's complex numbers. It's j. Get used to it. Not not super fun, but but you see, each each component, so the the real number component wait, I wrote it down there. What am I doing? <laughs> the the real number component that one is resistance. So the natural though the natural friction na natural friction of the material. And JB is the imaginary component. And that one we call reactants. And that is the geometry of the... Geometry of device. So this, this is the shape of the hourglass. This is how gritty or fine the sand is. And... Since this is dependent on the material, this is a material property. And since this one is dependent on the device, it is a device property. And it is due to geometry. So, like, the design of the device. And how the device uses the properties of electricity. Um, yeah, so... So, the grittiness, the grittier sand, right? Higher resistance. The finer sand, lower resistance, right? It's harder for sand to get through this because it's hard to get more than one piece of sand through the hole. Versus a really fine sand... 
will pour very smoothly. Lots of sand will be able to make it through the same sized hole. Meanwhile, if you have just any sand, some sand that will pour, we have different geometries that affect it. So the the wideness or the thinness to the point of, of preventing sand from leaving of the hourglass. I mean, like, this would also be a really uh, regrettable hourglass, right? This would cause some resistance. Well, not resistance. Reactance. The sand will react to the shape of the hourglass. Same thing with electricity. So, some devices will have either either resistance or reactance. And generally on DC, we only talk about resistance. On AC, they'll be both. Both resistance and reactance. Alright, cool. What is... That... Those are those are new letters, right? AC and DC, and you've you've probably heard about it, and it's not the classic rock band. Um, I'm pretty sure they were they were meaning something else. Uh, so let's talk about types of circuits, right? So when you plug something into the wall, we get AC power. So, what does the word AC mean? Or, what do the letters AC stand for? There we go. AC is alternating. Alternating current. Alternating current power. That's what it means. And that is one of those um, turn-of-the-century sort of... uh, terminologies we probably wouldn't have named it that now but since electricity is one of those has over a hundred years of history we've got some old names and old naming schema so what we mean by alternating is that it's sinusoidal it is sinusoidal it is of signs of sinusoids And sinusoids are anything that derives from a sine wave. So, literally a sine function. Sine of omega t plus theta. And there's some magnitude here. That that is that is the the normal the the traditional um, equation of a sinusoid. However, we're 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 starting here, so we're actually looking at a cosine. Right, because cosines start at the top and go down. So, m cosine omega t plus theta, right? So, what we have in our walls in the U.S. is 120 volts at 60 hertz. And that feels super cryptic. But what it means is that we have roughly a peak... We, we expect to have a consistent 120 volts when we plug something in. We expect it to hit... How do I explain this? So, so, first of all, we need to know what hertz is. What is hertz? Hertz is cycles per second. Is, is cycles per second... And honestly, it's generally written as just per seconds. But but what's per seconds? It's it's how how much of the the graph. It is it is from some point to its same point in the cyclical graph. So so 120 back up to positive 120. It's doing this 60 times a second. So this 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 
that I drew long is actually happening very, very fast. This is this is a very short time to make just one cycle. So we, like I said, we use a cosine. We use a cosine standard. So when we write the the equation of a function of a, a sine function, we actually write the cosine function, omega t plus theta, right? We just it's just one of those handshake things. We decided to do it. Um, it's generally more important for power systems, which y'all thankfully don't have to to worry too too much about. Um, electricity isn't the only thing that's sinusoidal. Okay? Analog signals. Analog sources, like sound, produce sinusoids or alternating signals. So when, when Gerard Way sings into their microphone, the, mi the sound comes out as a wave. The microphone takes that wave and digitizes it. It's taking some analog signal and it's turning it into electricity. So a signal is a source. So this is a source. Technically, it's not a DC source. It is an AC source, so you, we draw it with a squiggle inside. Same thing. So, AC signals provide voltage. So, we expect a voltage out of this. And we expect it to be, well, if we're looking at an outlet, we expect that voltage to be 120 volts. But why do we expect out of a wall a sinusoidal voltage? It comes from the way that that energy is produced. So generators produce AC. Why? So this this is this is a just take this as a generator, right? So these are these are coils. These are these are coils. They look like coils, so that's that's not too much of a stretch. Um, and it is magnetic wire. So basically, there is a connection between magnetism and electricity. Wherever you have magnetism, uh, perpendicular to that, you have you have electricity. And there is, there is some more complicated discussion there, but suffice it to say that if you have something magnetic near something that could conduct electricity, it will conduct electricity through that stuff without touching it. And it's kind of really, really cool. Uh, that is how motors work. That is how generators work. And basically, what's inside of here is some some metal bar right that spins and has a magnetic field and when it's its magnetic field spins it's dragging electrons through these wires every time it passes by it but the thing is is that it can only be pointed at any one set of electrons and in prime dragging electrons position for so long. So we get we get a spike when it's pointed here and then it goes down and then we get a spike when it's here again and and then it goes down and we get a spike and then it goes down. That's where the 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 alternating comes from. It's because of the geometry of the device. It is because it takes time, even if it's even if it's almost immeasurably small amount of time. It takes time for 
the magnet to be pointed here to then move to here and then move to here and so on. So each time it passes by one of these, it's it's conducting a little bit more, but it's also pulsing up and down and up and down and up and down. And so we do end up calling that a pulse as well. So on the other hand, DC DC is a straight line. DC is we expect a constant voltage. We don't expect it to be alternating. It is direct. Direct current. And we get it out of batteries, for example. The the most common example is batteries. So this one's a D cell. Ooh, that's not visible. So this is a D cell, this is a C cell, A cell, no, double A cell, triple A cell, and we just call this baby a 9 volt because it's a 9 volt battery. All of the the alphabet soup ones are 1.5 volts. Maybe incorrect on the D cell, but all of them are are no, I'm pretty sure. Uh in the US, standard batteries are 1.5 volts, or they are literally labeled 9 volt, 12 volt. Uh, flashlight batteries tend to be 12 volt batteries. Car batteries are who knows. Um, but these, we expect over time, over some, some rated time, because batteries are only rated to host their peak voltage for an amount of time. So for some amount of time that is is rated on the battery, we expect constant voltage. It it is it is a container of potential. So eventually it will empty out and it will start slacking off, but that is past that that rated time, right? So during that rated time, it's constant. It's constant we get what we paid for. So, DC comes from batteries, but it can also be what we call rectified. So, rectify the word implies that it is fixing something. It is fixes. What does it fix, though? It's fixing the pulses. So we plug this end of some of our laptop power supply into the wall, right? Wall outlet. This goes into the wall. And we know that the wall is 120 volts at 60 hertz. Which is, by the way, the prime way you figure out uh, if, if you're dealing with AC and you haven't been told. Uh, if you were given a a measure in, of cycles per second, you are dealing with AC. Uh, so, so if we plug, we know that this goes into the wall and we know that the wall has, has sinusoidal power. It has alternating current. This side goes into our laptop, right? And our laptop has a battery and we know that batteries, right? They're, they're, direct they're they're constant so so what what black magic is happening in here that turns ac to dc well it's got a rectifier in it and we use diodes for that and we can talk about that later um circuit wise but basically we use something that only lets current in in one direction you can only pass current this way in a standard diode. You cannot, if you try and get current through this way, it won't go. It behaves like the wire's broken. And if you set these up in, say, opposing directions, and then you feed a signal that is going in one direction, and then it's going in another, and going in one direction, you're going to force it to put out voltage whether it's in 
the positive direction or the negative direction. That's what rectifying means. Rectifying means it fixes it fixes the AC pulsing of the input. I was going to write that word completely backwards. There we go. It fixes the AC pulses, right? The, the it goes up and then it goes down and it goes up. It puts out something more constant. But since we know that we can convert these two, right? We know that, that, that they're kind of related. We can, we can start to think about them together, right? So since AC changes with time, and we know it does, right? Uh, and since DC is a constant value, we can think about DC as just a point in time of AC. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, we have our voltage or our current or our power, whatever on the y-axis. T is our x-axis, so it's changing with time. Well, what if we froze time? What if we said t equals 11? So we go over to t equals 11 on the x-axis, and we just use that value. Yeah, there's a function. There's something that will change with whatever time we put into it, but we've just frozen it in place. We now have a constant value. And we can think about it that way. It's not exact, but it's a good way to, to link these two together in our minds. AC and DC circuits, aside from, from specific cases, right? Things like we're using the fact that it's going in one direction and then another to create something different. Aside from specific device reactions, all of the fundamental laws still work. All of the, the, the conservation equations, the, the, the way that voltage relates to current and impedance, those are all the same. So we don't have to learn two totally different uh, regimes of math in order to do circuits. All we have to do is know that AC and DC have slightly different characteristics because one's kind of more simplified than the other. Kind of like when we, we used to think about frictionless planes versus when we added friction in physics, right? So, so let's, let's try putting stuff together. Let's, let's do us some, some recap. So we have three values. We have voltage, we have current, and we have impedance. Voltage is V, current is I, impedance is Z, but we can also use R when we mean just the real number portion. So, voltage, this thing has an impedance, and we've got current going through it. And they're related by Ohm's law. And we have V equals I Z, right? That's Ohm's law. And if we were then to say, oh, I don't know, make V equals five volts and Z equals 10 ohms, then we could say find I. And it wouldn't be too much, right? Because it's just a little bit of algebra to get I isolated. Get I on its own by dividing Z across. And you get I equals V over Z. 5 over 10. Half an amp. There's half an amp going through this little tiny circuit. But why do we know the direction of I? Do we? Because... Like, if this were if this were an hourglass, right? I could just look and see that all right, sand's going down, makes sense, it's following gravity. 
but we just we we said before that that charges don't really they're not really affected by gravity that way they're going whether gravity's pulling them down left right or to the moon and actually that's a good thing because we made it to the moon using electrons um but like how did we know and the answer is we didn't um we we made it up we we said all right well this looks pretty good today we're doing this and unfortunately it's about as arbitrary as that but since my instinct and your instinct are totally different beasts we come up with conventions more more times scientists handshake and say we'll do it this way so that all of our math comes out the same and that's it so so that's what we mean by we say a convention and it's how we've decided to label diagrams so convention just means agreed upon standard and Usually, it's not even a stated thing. Most textbooks don't even admit which standard they're using. You just have to kind of know. It's a little annoying. But our standard says that we have... Actually, I did stuff out of order. Says that we have to decide where ground is. Remember, ground is this symbol. You can also, it can also be drawn as this symbol, um, attached to a wire somewhere, um, or you know, go ham. Use <laughs> use good old uh, uh, machine diagram ground. That's fine. That's still ground, cause ground is down. Ground is down. You're standing on it. I'm standing on it. We put ground at the bottom of a circuit. Um, generally, there is a wire at the bottom of the circuit where there is no device. And that's kind of what we're, what we're looking for. So that's how we know when it's okay to just ground a whole line. Um, we then have to put signs. So, so label signs on resistive elements or well there's not really an easy impedic elements but but resistive elements so when i say that please understand i mean elements with impedance so this one and this one and we put them in this order we put them at positive to the left and positive up. So you can think about it as things are positive going clockwise. If your diagrams, if you're given a question that already has things labeled, um, we'll tell you how to deal with that in a little bit. But, but in general, elements with impedance, we put signs on. Why do we put signs on it? Well, because, because of Ohm's law. V equals IR, right? If this thing has an R and we assume it's going to have a current going through it, then it has a V and a voltage has a positive and a negative. So technically there's a VR1 here and a VR2 here. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later, too. So how do we decide where the current goes, though? Well, we've agreed that current goes from positive to negative. And that makes sense because the... Well, it doesn't make sense. Current goes in this direction. Current goes in that direction. And that these, right, this one, these are current sources. If the head of the arrow is here, then this side must be negative and this side must be positive. And you can just do that, okay? 
this is maybe not the most intuitive um direction and i'm fairly certain most most of you with experience with classes that have talked about this are going to say haha yes current comes out of the positive side that's fine it can do that we don't do that in this class we have we have chosen we have set this aside as our standard that's what we're going with so what if the circuit already has a label on it and what if that label is wrong? We we say our current's going this way. That's that's doing this is going to make sure all of our math comes out correctly. But but the circuit asserts that current's coming out the top. Well, if if let's just use this resistor up here, right? So let's let's draw that. It's got capital I coming out, coming through this way from positive to negative, but I've drawn current going this way, so counterclockwise, and that means that my current's going to come through negative to positive. Well, that just means that the current that is labeled equals the opposite of my current, because sine Sign means direction. Sign means direction. Alrighty, so that's what we got for, for this lecture. Next time, we are going to talk about simplifying impedance sources. So, you know, when you have multiple of these, uh, what to do, how to make that less messy. Um, we're going to talk about conservation in circuits. So... Uh, this one's going to be our Kirchhoff's Laws. And then we're going to see about how we put it all together. Alrighty, great job. Go take a break and unwind a bit, and I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye!